What I thought I wanted was for God to feel really sorry for me. You know, your husband died of cancer because death and disease and decay was brought into the world at the fall. We can marvel at other people's sufferings or blessings. God is not giving us the grace for their shoes. We want detachment even from good things, right? But what does finding love again look like after a 21-year marriage? Yeah, I now have a husband. Kendra, welcome back to the podcast. So good to see you again. Yeah. Be here. It's been a year. <laughs> it's been a year. <laughs> You've had a big year. Yes, I have. Although, you know, they say all things are possible with God. That I, in my experience, that is actually true. <laughs> all right. So people who heard your episode a year ago now, you talked about grief. You had recently lost your beloved husband. It was really moving for a lot of people. So thank you for just opening up and sharing because we got so much incredible feedback, people saying that they were inspired, encouraged, even how you grieve, learning how to grieve. And I know you said everyone grieves differently, but thank you for doing that because it really touched a lot of people. You're welcome. You know, it's, uh, I don't think anybody wants to sign up to be the spokesperson for, for that. But one of the most helpful things a friend ever said to me is, you know, you decided to to try to show what a Catholic life looks like. Mm. And this is part of that. So what has happened in the last year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll let you share the news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I uh, was married in uh, th this summer. Uh, you are married I now. I am <laughs> married. Yes. I, I, uh, I was wedded. I was wedded this summer. Um, yes. Uh, so... Yeah, I now have a husband and four stepchildren. So that brings our grand total to 14. So uh, yeah, it is not less complicated, but <laughs> it's very good. So I remember on the show last fall, you, you know, you were sharing really beautifully about your late husband's life and about your, your family and everything. And then I was kind of towards the end saying, I, I don't remember if we cut this out of the episode afterwards. I know we were discussing, should we cut it out or leave it in? But I asked you, well, are you dating again? Or are you open to dating again? And I think you said at the time, I'm, you know, you weren't dating, but you might be open to it in the future. Mm -hmm. Here you are a year later. Quick timeline. Nicely done, Kendra. You are remarried. <laughs> Can you share about what, what it was like to find love again after you had this very beautiful and happy marriage of how many years was your first marriage? Uh, 21. 21 years. years. Yeah. And how many kids? 10 kids. It's incredible. I mean, yeah. an incredible legacy your your husband and you created together. But what does love, <laughs> finding love again look like after a right, 21 so, year marriage? Yeah, I guess to, to start at the beginning, uh, I, I mentioned in that last episode how uh, one of the first things I did to try to get to know my my first husband, Jim, my late husband, uh, was throw a fake Halloween party where I just sort of blurted out that I was throwing a party and he should come over. So then I had to find people for it. And we had this pumpkin carving party. This was how you met Jim in the first, is, you, yes. you got him to, yes, I to guess, come and connect and with you. Hang out with me socially. Yeah. Uh, you so, planned a party just for him, just for folks who yes. didn't remember this from the first episode, which was adorable. Yeah. You thought he was cute. You guys made eye contact at church, right? Yes. And yeah. then you... volunteering at our youth group. So okay. he was thinking, you know, don't date the other volunteers at the youth group because that could make things complicated, right? Fair he enough. He was like, but come on, what are we all doing here? You're like, so I'm anyway. here to find a man. <laughs> so I just told him I was having this party and then I had to put this party together. So then last year I get a last minute phone call from a friend of mine and she says, I'm having a Halloween party and you have to come and don't wear a costume. And it's like, wait a minute. It's like two days before Halloween. Like, All right. So it turns out that she threw a fake Halloween party for me <laughs> with two of, uh, of our other friends and, who are mutual friends with John, my now husband. So we, met his uh he was an empty nester at the time his youngest uh, was off at college and uh so we met and we talked and you know he found out that I mean, he didn't find out our kids went to the same school so he knew who i was he knew my husband he um our youngest it was his youngest graduated from high school with my uh third so he knew of me i didn't know him uh but yeah then he did not call me so 
<laughs> but so wait, you met John at this at Halloween this party Halloween that was party. set up just to get you guys to meet by your yes. friend. Wow. That yes. was very uh, proactive yeah. of your friend. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very sweet. But yeah, I think that understandably, uh, he had some hesitation about, uh, you know, jumping back into a lot of little kids and, you know, I, I always joke and I'm sure you, and I'm sure you get this, that like we get recognized by one person everywhere kind of thing where, and everyone's very nice, but you know, it's a different kind of life to come into when you weren't like, you know, uh, when you weren't there at the beginning. Uh, so, so yeah, he did not call me right away, but, uh, about three months later, he, uh, I was at mass alone on Sunday morning, which never happens. And I, that's a good story how I ended up there, but, uh, tell it, I guess I will, will. but yeah, so I ended up at, at the early mass alone and he saw me. And I guess, you know, it was different than, than my usual entire pew full of people. And he just sort of thought, okay, I am supposed to call her. I'm supposed mm -hmm. to meet her. And uh, so then I didn't want to go out with him because I was like, come on, it's been three months. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, but yeah, then my friend talked me into it. Uh, and yeah, we got along really well. But okay, so the story of how I ended up alone at Mass on a Sunday morning. Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life coffee company on a mission to fund the pro-life movement one cup of delicious coffee at a time. Why are they called Seven Weeks Coffee? Because at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and it's the same time that the heartbeat can be first clearly detected on ultrasound. That's why Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of every sale to support pregnancy resource centers across the country. Seven Weeks Coffee has raised over half of a million dollars, $500,000 for these centers, and has helped save 5,000 lives by providing free ultrasounds and other resources to moms in need. Now, let me tell you about the delicious coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is harvested from the top 1% to 2% of beans in the world. Their beans are mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, and low-acid, and they're organically farmed. Seven Weeks Coffee truly checks all the boxes. And just in time for the holiday season, Seven Weeks Coffee is having their biggest promotion yet. You can enjoy exclusive discounts, free gifts with every order, and new limited edition coffees. And exclusively for my listeners, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your first order. So the story of how I ended up alone at Mass on a Sunday morning goes back to something that really has been sort of pivotal in my life and something that I just that that I was introduced to since we talked last time was this book called um, Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence, mm -hmm. which is this tiny book written half of it in the 16th and half of it in the 17th century by a saint and a priest. Uh, and it basically argues that everything that happens in your life, for good or for bad is specifically willed by God for your own good. Mm -hmm. And I think we all, you know, I certainly believed that on some level, right? That, that I believed, you know, sure, God has a plan for my life. God's involved, but God doesn't care. You know, I, I would have thought, you know, God doesn't care what the weather is. God, um, and then on a bigger, on a bigger level, especially as somebody who had gone through hardship and grief, what I thought I wanted was for God to feel really sorry for me, that God to think, oh, you know, your husband died of cancer because death and disease and decay was brought into the world at the fall. But this book really argues that, that that's not really what we believe about God, and that's not really what scripture teaches about God. What what I really believe about God is that God is a God of miracles, that he is a God who's involved in, in our specific lives. And he doesn't will our sins. He doesn't will the sins of others. But the consequences of the sins of others or our own sins in our lives, he does will that for our own good. And, and it's, so reading this book, I hate it. I hate this book. It's terrible. <laughs> well, this it was is, so frustrating. I, I mean, what's just going through my mind as you're saying this is Romans eight twenty eight. 
God wills all things for the good of those that love him. Right. And that he uses all things, God uses all things for the good, excuse me, God wills all things for the good of those that love him, meaning God uses everything, including the consequences of our sin. God can use that and he does use that Mm -hmm. for our good. Right. That's how powerful he is. And that's, I mean, so it's scriptural. The book you're describing Mm -hmm. is scriptural. It is kind of a, a shocking and in some ways counterintuitive idea. Right. That God really is using everything for my good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what it meant in my life was coming to the understanding that my husband's death was God's will for me. And, and I had heard people say that, and I had complained about people saying that because I really wasn't ready to hear that. But I think that, that reading this book it took me a lot of time. It took me months to sort of think about it a little and concede these little points to it. Uh, but just trying to see, all right, so a- as an example, when, when Jim was in the hospital, a priest friend of ours came and brought a relic of, uh, of Blessed Alvaro del Portillo. And this same relic had been used to bless a woman who had many tumors in her, many melanoma tumors in her lungs, which is exactly what Jim had. And he blessed Jim with this relic. And Jim did not, the, the, this, this other woman, he was there when she was blessed, this, this priest, Father Mark. And she stood up and, and was apparently completely heal, healed in that moment. And that did not happen. My husband then continued on to have the surgery that he was scheduled and, uh, and, you know, and eventually died. So I believe that God can heal and that sometimes he doesn't. And if that's the case, there must be a reason for that. And what (laughs) the only thing that has consistently made sense to me as I try to, you know, make sense of all of this is that, is that God wills things for, that will eventually be for our own good. Uh, and, and so I really, you know, reading this book, I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe I'm just going to try to live like I believe this. (laughs) Maybe I'm going to try to, experience the little setbacks in my day, the crazy things that kids do, being stuck in traffic, being stuck in, you know, good, uh, bad weather. I'm going to try to think, all right, you know, this is the the same way that, that my, that my track coach at cross country, uh, you know, my track and cross country coach at USC treated me, right? Like, did he will my suffering? Yes, he did. But it was to get the best that I was capable out of me. So I'm going to view, you know, I, I, I was going to wait on, uh, on, on seeing how this all applied to, uh, you know, to my widowhood, but I could look at it like that for my, for my day-to-day life. And, uh, so (laughs) it was, you know, weeks later, uh, you know, not a very long time after this, I've decided, all right, you know, this, this is how I'm going to see things from now on and middle of the night, my kids have uh, a couple friends sleeping over. The children of my good friend who gave me this book, uh, <laughs> and I have three kids up in the middle of the night barfing all over three different rooms in the house, like door jams. I mean, just huge mess. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, here we go. I am going to experience this as what God wants me to be doing at like two o'clock in the morning. (laughs) So I get it all cleaned up. The kids who are sleeping over decide they don't want to stay in Barftown, USA. So I get them in the car, drive them home, come back. uh, And I figure, all right, I'm going to set my alarm and go to early mass on my own because who knows who's going to get sick next. And that was the mass where <laughs> that morning, that's how I ended up at mass on my own um, uh, when God put it on John's heart to to give me a call. So, uh, yeah, I think it somehow worked. 
it somehow worked. Um, yeah. And it was the opportunity of seeing you alone because mm-hmm. before maybe he just saw you in context of all your beautiful kids and it was maybe overwhelming for him. It sounds like, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to put words yeah, into no, his no, mouth or your so. story, but as you were saying earlier, and so, but that opportunity of you being there on, on at mass that morning, that moved him to call you and say, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out. And to hear him tell it, uh, that, that he, he needed some time to, you know, to, to sort through some of his own personal baggage. And so, um, I think that, I, I think that being, being thoughtful about, uh, about making a big decision is a good thing, but I always sort of laugh at that, uh, that somehow that was, um, that was part of our love story. <laughs> So I, I want to explore this concept more with you because it's a very beautiful one and it has huge implications. This idea that every single thing in our lives, every circumstance, every event God is using for our good. And you used other language earlier about God willing it. And I want to just kind of explore that more because for example, your husband's passing, right? God could have saved his life, right? God can save anyone's life. God can do anything. He can raise the dead. And he, he will raise the dead on the last day. You know, we are it, through the power of Jesus Christ. We have that resurrection of the body and we can go to eternal life with, with Jesus, with God. But sometimes the child does die of cancer. You know, sometimes the horrible thing does happen and death happens before it should, or death just happens, period. Is God willing the death or is God allowing the death and then using the death for good? What yeah, are your thoughts? I think, you know, and I'm not a theologian and I, me neither. Right. <laughs> um, so, but I, I yeah. would say that just mm-hmm. like, as I look at my mm-hmm. life, as I look at my experiences, you know, and, and through this lens, which really colors everything now, mm-hmm. um, it just, it just was the only thing that made sense mm-hmm. because otherwise everything is chaos. Mm-hmm. Otherwise there, there's just this, almost meaninglessness, Mm -hmm. um, of, of these big burdens that, that, that sometimes we have to carry. Uh, and so this idea of that, you know, people talk about the tapestry, right. Mm -hmm. Where, where, uh, you only see the back of the tapestry. And so it's just a mess and it's just knots. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you can't see it, but then, you know, at the end of times, you you turn it around and you see what all of what all of this was for. Um, so I I will I, I I can't claim I guess to have a perfect understanding of it, but but this idea that that God would actually look at a situation and say and say as hard as this is for you right now that that this will work for good in your life. And, and I pray for the lives of the people that I love. Um, and it's a hard saying (laughs) it is. Um, but I think it's the, where I have come to right now, it's, it's really the only thing that, that fits with, with God's perfections, you know, the, the, the way that I see them. And I think that in, in some ways it's, it's about how you phrase it. And, you know, is it, is it God's will or is it, you know, that God is working through it? And sometimes I think that, that it would be hard to tell the difference between those two things. It's a, it, I, yeah. Cause in your day-to-day life, it, it, we kind of break down, well, God, we know can't will evil. Death is evil. God can't will evil. Uh, or death is a consequence, I should say, of evil. Um, but God does not will the evil, but he permits the evil, and we we can commit the evil through our freedom of, of choice and ability to say, I'm going to do what's wrong. I think about, and I was just looking this up, this idea of the happy fault. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you're familiar. Yes. Yeah. And I was just looking this up, but uh, Easter Vigil, there is part of the liturgy, this uh, this uh, <laughs> reflection on, oh, Felix culpa, or oh, happy fault. And the idea here and, and the, the phrase here in English is, oh, happy fault, oh, necessary sin of Adam, which grant, gained for us so great a redeemer. Mm-hmm. So because of Adam's fall, we got the redeemer, we got Jesus Christ, and we, we, we all of the incredible graces and mercies that come with it. So God used even sin to bring about greater grace, which again, even other people's sin are just the natural consequences of 
sin, original sin, death can be brought to such beautiful gifts in the end. I mean, this is the great contradiction of, of our faith, right? Mm -hmm. Them in the mystery of our faith. Yeah, absolutely. But then I, I feel like what are the things in my life that, that make me the most frustrated are, are times when it feels like everything's out of control and, and to try to view life mm -hmm. as not out of control, as just not necessarily in my control, that, that if God really does have control of my life, that if I really desire to correspond to the graces that God wants to give me, if I want to cooperate, you know, with, with what he's trying to do in my life, then, then sometimes, you know, sitting in traffic, I guess is God's will for me at that moment. Mm -hmm. And there was a time where I would get super frustrated about that. And now I try to see it as, okay, like here I am stuck here. I'm going to be late for a thing and I should have left earlier. <laughs> and that is a terrible feeling, but you know, how can, how mm -hmm. can I be open to what could be good in this moment? You know, what, what am I, you, you know, what could I listen to? What could I think about? What conversation could I have? And it's just, it's just such a more, I think, fruitful way to mm -hmm. experience the, the smaller challenges in, in, in life and the big ones, I would also say, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly, you know, we all face all those little things that can be so frustrating in day-to-day -day life. What's, what's been the most unexpected thing that you've experienced because of living the way that you're living now in that mindset of everything that's happened is permitted explicitly by God for my good. In today's modern world, it can be very difficult to take the time and the space to pray and even to know how to pray. That's why I love the Hallow app. The Hallow app is the number one Christian app in the world. It's been downloaded over 15 million times and it helps us deepen our relationship with God. When you use the Hallow app, you get access to over 10,000 guided prayers, meditations, stories, and other content to help you with your prayer. Whether you're driving in your car or you're doing dishes or you're just going about your day and you just need five to 10 minutes to sit down and focus on what matters most, your relationship with God, Hallow app will help you do that. With Hallow, you'll learn to pray with scripture using the Bible. You'll also discover prayers that have been prayed by Christians for thousands of years. You can download Hallow for free for three months when you go to the link in the description or go to hallow.com slash Lila. That's hallow.com slash Lila. Download Hallow today and deepen your prayer walk with God. I, I think that the biggest thing, you know, was, was being, you know, open to to meeting John and having that, um, and having that be sort of one of those God moments where I was like, okay, I'm going to lean into this. And then, you know, sometimes I think God gives you a little sort of attaboy, like, yes, that's what I wanted you to do in that situation. But then other little things that really have been, ha have been meaningful, you know, in, in, in my parenting journey, <laughs> things like my, uh, my youngest daughter took all of the craft supplies that were neatly sorted and just dumped them into a giant mound in the middle of the rug. And she just, you know, thought that would be fun. And obviously I had a conversation with her about why we should not do that. But instead of just lamenting this, completely losing my cool, I got my other daughters and we sat, we put some music on and we sat around this rug and we sorted the craft supplies and we ended up having some good conversations and, and it just, it was one of those things that, that, you know, if I had let that just, you know, frustration bubble up and take over, then, you know, my first inclination is fine. I'm just going to throw all this stuff away. Why is this in our house to begin mm -hmm. with? But, but seeing is it all right, you know, why would God have wanted this for me in this moment? Um, and, you know, it's not always going to be that obvious, but but to try to see things as an opportunity and not as like a curse. <laughs> um, and we really did. It, it was a completely enjoyable afternoon um, when it, I, I could have let it devolve into um, something unpleasant. <laughs> I mean, what you're describing sounds like the way saints are supposed to live and saints live. Right. 
Yeah. And so I'm able to manage it here and there. <laughs> no, it's, it's so good for me to hear that. Cause I mean, in, in my daily life and I've got three littles and they're six months, you know, almost three, almost five, but you know, I, I patience is something that I didn't realize I didn't have as much as I thought I did <laughs> until I became a mother. We'll just say that. And it's such an incredibly beautiful and true view to say this moment is an incredible gift from God. And what, if, what is God teaching me in this moment, regardless of what annoyance or frustration might hit me. Right. Yeah. So thank absolutely. you. Thank you for sharing that. Cause that, <laughs> that ministered to me, you know, just hearing you say that and it's something I need to remember. And I think we can all remember, we all, we're all would be good to remember that every single little thing that happens is for our good. God is using it for our good. If we will let him, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> if we will let him is the key. If we'll let him. Yes. <laughs> What's been some of the unexpected, um, blessings of finding love after loss. Yeah. So it, it doesn't sound romantic, but there's so many like practical things day to day where living as a single mother, it's, it's, I, I'm so able to appreciate now how God's design for, for the family is having two parents, you know, you just to, to have somebody to commiserate with mm -hmm. when, when things are frustrating to have somebody to, you know, talk things over with, that was um, something that I didn't, you know, I just really took for granted that that there was uh, there was no other like adult in the house to decide. All right, you know, how am I going to handle this situation? How am I going to, um, you know, handle this this you know thing that this kid did? Um, and to just uh, to have somebody now who I trust and can share these decisions to share responsibility with. And it, it becomes really obvious to me how, um, how important that is just for, for, for a family dynamic. And, and there are plenty of people who are, who, you know, don't have that in their lives now, but, um, but I guess I would say that the biggest thing is that I feel like I, again, have a vocation to marriage mm -hmm. because when you when you're married, that's, that's a vocation. It's a person, but it's also a sacrament. And that ends when, when the, when the person dies, your vocation is over and you have to start all over to determine, all right, what, how does God want me to grow in personal holiness? What is God's path of sanct sanctification for me? And is that marriage? Is that single life or is that religious life? And there's plenty of great saints who had big families and were uh, widowed and, you know, went on to start religious orders or, or join them. It's certainly less mm -hmm. common these days, but, but once I had determined, you know, I really feel like I, that, like that God has mm -hmm. given me another vocation to marriage. And at that point, that's the way that, that God wants me to grow in holiness. That's the way that God wants me to try to get to heaven with another person and trying to get that other person to heaven. And so all of those, you know, day-to-day -day things, all of that, you know, the great feeling of, you know, having someone love you and being able to laugh with somebody at the end of the day, being, you know, not having to go to events alone, <laughs> all of that just, but all of that is great. But it really, it, it, on a grand scheme, it pales in comparison to the fact that if God has called me to marriage, then, you know, then, then that's the way that I am going to, you know, reach my goal of being with him for eternity. What, did, what advice do you have for people that were, that experienced loss, that were widowed, widowers, and they're wondering if they can find love again or wondering what their vocation may be? It's a challenge. I think that in, in a lot of ways, because my because my first marriage felt so successful that I was, I was happy in, in my first marriage that once things settled down enough for me to really be able to think about it, I, I realized it really was something that, that I wanted again. And, and I'm sure that there are people who had really challenging marriages who, who want to give it another go and people who had, um, 
who had happy marriages who decided, you know, or who really feel like that was enough. Uh, but, but I think that if you feel like, if you have discerned that you have a vocation to marriage, then I, it was a really overwhelming sort of prospect. How am I going to find someone? The, you know, widows with 10 kids aren't the, you know, aren't the hottest commodity out there. Come on. Very beautiful commodity. <laughs> very beautiful, Kendra. Um, and your kids are amazing. But yes, it's a very unique, yes. you're, you were highly unique to be a, a mother of 10 children and widowed. It's very unique. And I did, I, I looked at the dating mm -hmm. sites and I pretty quickly determined that that, that didn't seem right for me. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I have, um, an app on my phone for a like resale clothing place that I like, and you can go in there and you can put, you know, exactly the like type of clothing you want and the color and the <laughs> like length of the skirt. And then the items that match those parameters will come up and you can pick the one you want. And then right next to it on my phone was a dating app where you could do that exact same thing. <laughs> And at some point, it just didn't feel like that was how I was going to be able to meet someone. I know other people have a different experience of it, but but what would my advice be to somebody is, I would say in prayer, God, if, if you've put this on my heart that I feel like I want to be married, I can't do that <laughs> because my whole deal is crazy, but you can do that. And so if either, either help me realize this um, you know, this feeling that you've given me, help me make that happen or take that feeling mm -hmm. away and help me be content with the life that I have. Because by, by almost all measures, even as a single mom, you know, I, I had a, a good life and I had support from a lot of, of people who cared about our family. Um, and I, you know, had, I was not facing a lot of the hardships that other, that other widows face, but, but I just had that feeling that, you know, that I did want to be married again. And, and so I just, you know, I told, I, I prayed that God would either help me make that happen or, or take that away. So, because that's the teetering on despair that you really, you, you, you have to avoid is, is to not focus on here's this thing I want that I can't have. Mm. So to give it to God and say, all right, like you can make this happen, help me or take that away so that I'm not, you know, focusing on, on something that you don't want for me. That's such a beautiful prayer. And I, I think it can apply to all of us. Any, 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 maybe unmet longing that anybody has, whether they've never been married and they're hoping to be married or they're in some kind of a tough situation and they're longing for some freedom from it or relief from it, you know, either help me out of this or help me you know, towards this thing that I'm longing for, or it's not your will. Give me the, you know, take the longing away or relieve the burden or, or help me carry the burden so that I'm not struggling so much. I, I guess I think about people and I know people as an example, you know, friends who are seeking to get married, they haven't found the one yet you know, that, that hasn't materialized for them. They're, they're in the longing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, that's part of where the, the, the struggle to trust comes, you know, what is even the prayer to pray? Take away the longing, send me the guy, uh, help me deal with the longing. Yeah. You know. But we want detachment even from good things, mm -hmm. right? Even from, from things that we feel really strongly would help us to be better people. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, there still has to be that, that level of detachment, even from a thing that we really want, because otherwise we're making a God out of that longing, um, out of that desire. I find that such a, I don't know, such a mysterious part of the Christian life is at the one hand, hoping and praying for the good things, the vocation to be fully realized, the consolation that, you know, helps you you know, not just persevere, but persevere with the joy uh, in, in, out of the struggle you're in or whatever it is. Well, at the same time, we're asked to pick up our cross and carry him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our Lord and Savior was crucified naked on a cross. And that's what he's like, that's the model, the Christian model, <laughs> <Right>. like <laughs> death and abject, you know, suffering and public shaming and all of this. And, and yet we're also called to pray for the good things, you know, and pray for our daily bread, pray for the vocation, pray for the blessing, pray for the miracle. 
I don't know. I, I on a daily basis, I mar- I think I marvel at that and how to like live that where you accept the crosses, but then at the same time, we're called to, you know, pray for the, pray for the best, pray for the good, pray for the healing, all of that. Well, and when you read the lives of the saints, mm-hmm. I, I mean, that that's what we have signed up for is a life of, of suffering, but but a, a transformational suffering, a suffering mm-hmm. that, you know, it's it's amazing to read the uh, the things that the saints have gone through and have managed to maintain joy or at least come out the other end of it with joy and and understanding that that being that our faith doesn't protect us from suffering. It just helps us to experience it differently. What's it been like blending families? Yeah. Because John has how many kids? If he has four kids. And then you have yes. 10. Yeah. You have 14 kids now. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. had one baby last year. <laughs> That's my news. You had, you had four more. Yeah. So what's that been like? Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because this is a premium product made from the best materials for your little one. And everylife.com is a pro-life company. In fact, when you join the Changing Lives Club at everylife.com, you will get 10% off your order and you will also be able to donate one month's free supply to a mom or a baby in need so that they can get the diapers that they need. Did you know that some of the biggest diaper companies today like Huggies and Pampers are owned by conglomerates that are pro-abortion? That's why Every Life is so important. Not only is the product better, I know from personal experience, than the Huggies and Pampers products, but the Every Life diaper is also part of a mission to save lives. When you go to everylife.com slash join, you can join the Changing Lives Club. This way you can set up a subscription to get your diapers and your wipes, these premium products delivered right to your door for your little one. And after three months of the subscription, you will be able to donate for free a month's supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So what are you waiting for? Go to everylife.com slash join, join the Changing Lives Club, use the code LILA at checkout, Get 10% off your order, start your subscription, and after three months, you can donate a full month supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So the cute thing to me is that, you know, our kids knew each other. Like I went and they kind of, they, the older kids followed each other on Instagram already. Wow. <laughs> Which only my adult kids. Um, that has been a challenge, but but a really beautiful one. Um, I feel like a good way to uh you know to be able to stay in something like you know blogging or being on catholic mm-hmm. social media is you have to have this sort of thick skin you can't be somebody who needs everybody to like them all the time i think and so i sort of have have had that naturally and then all of a sudden i was meeting these people and I really, really wanted them to like me. <laughs> it's like, oh no, what do I do? I don't know how to do this. Uh, but it's been, it's been great. His, his two younger daughters moved into our house just before the wedding, but we took what used to be our guest room and everybody, you know, went furniture, sh- flat pack furniture shopping and put together all of the furniture, which, you know, is sort of a rite of passage for relationships. You can put the furniture together. <laughs> Um, and so just little, little milestones like that, where, um, you know, combining not just our families and our physical presence, but our, um, you know, traditions around different things, you know, how we, um, how we approach, uh, you know, how we approach challenges, how, how how we celebrate holidays, all of those things. The little kids were really, my little kids were really doing the heavy lifting, on on all of it because they had just fell in love with um with John's kids and uh and they don't have any of that sort of you know baggage of of trying to uh approach people the right way or you know they were just so excited <laughs> to get you know new people in the family loved them and uh would you know my youngest daughter would try to, to be sitting on both of their laps at, <laughs> um, at mass somehow. Um, and my 
uh, next oldest daughter has been writing letters to her uh, stepsister, her out of state stepsisters. Um, Are they at college? Uh, the yes. Older ones? One, mm -hmm. the oldest uh, lives out of state uh, and is and is working, and then the two are, are at uh, Benedictine in Kansas. So, and then my two, my next two to graduate, went and visited them on a college mm -hmm. visit. I think it was more just to hang out with them, but <laughs> I don't want to unfairly smooth over things because it's any time, uh, you know, you're combining families, there's going to be bumps, but I think that it, it certainly feels worth it. And it certainly feels like, um, like especially worth it in the long term because you're not looking at this as a summer or a year, you're looking at it as the, you know, the rest of your life. Was that part of the discernment process for you, how the families connected or how the kids did with each other? Or did that kind of speak into it at all for yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, when I was first dating John, he he was an empty nester. He His kids were all, you know, all out of the house, some at college. Um, so it wasn't until, um, you know, until the girls had come home from break and we had been dating for mm -hmm. um months at that point, uh, before I met them, but he knew all of my kids because they were at home. Um, well, my kids who were at home, <laughs> he knew. Yeah. It, it was a little bit strange to meet them after we, uh, after our relationship was already pretty serious. My little kids especially have mm -hmm. been just so thrilled to have <laughs> a, um, to have a father figure in the house again and somebody who is really willing to be completely open hearted to them. Um, but, but the relationships, you know, are, are going to be different. Um, the, the relationship that, you know, that I have mm -hmm. with, with his kids is going to be different. The relationship that he has with my, you know, older kids is the, the older five call him, John and the younger five call him dad. <laughs> and that was just sort of a natural break um, where that is what felt right um, for for them. And but everybody has been very friendly and, and open. It's very beautiful, Kendra. I'm so, so happy for you. I know you will always love your first husband. And now, you know, he's in heaven. <laughs> we, <laughs> we pray with God forever. Um, how has that been to love again when you're, you know, is it, is the love different? I don't know if you can share, share whatever mm -hmm. you're comfortable sharing, obviously. But I know that when I've talked to people who've lost a spouse before, sometimes there's a sense of how can I ever love again, you know, because mm -hmm. of this first love. But then, you know, when they experience, if they do experience a new love, they realize, wow, it's, it's, it's the same, but it's also very different. So there's still this kind of specialness that I had with my first spouse. And now I have this different specialness with my second spouse. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, how that's been for both of you. Yeah. And it's something that I have heard a lot from, um, from other people is this sort of idea of, yeah, how, how could, how could you love again? And I think part of it stems from, from sort of our, you know, our, our fallen nature a little bit that I think that there's part of us that thinks, oh, well, you know, if, if I die, I want my spouse to just, you know, keep vigil and <laughs> mourn me the whole rest of my life. But that's not how, that's not how love works, um, mm -hmm. in, I, I, in eternity, right. Mm -hmm. That, that we, we have this understanding. Well, we, we are aware of this concept that is mm -hmm. so hard for us to understand of that in heaven, their love is perfect. Love is perfected. And that means that there won't be jealousy and there won't be misunderstanding. And so we have to, you know, believe that the, the goal, right, is that I would get to heaven and that John would get to heaven and that Jim is there waiting for us and that we're all per friends and it's perfectly fine and not weird. right? <laughs> and that's we can't imagine that um, because we don't have experience of love like that. But, but I know for me that, yes, I will always love Jim. And I'm so grateful mm -hmm. for 
um, the way that he helped me grow. I'm grateful for my children and for the father that he was to them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it, it felt very real to me that, that marriage is until death. And it felt like that was over. And the, you know, the love remains and the, and, and the, you know, the admiration, the gratitude remains, but, but I, I did feel available to love again. And I think that sometimes you hear from, uh, from somebody who only has one child and they would say, well, I love this child so much and I wouldn't want to divide Mm -hmm. my love and by, Mm -hmm. you know, if I have another child, then I wouldn't Mm -hmm. be able to love this one as much. And of course, a love for a spouse is different than a love for, for children. And it's more proprietary. <laughs> it, it is perfectly proprietary, but, but I found that, 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 that love wasn't divided, that it was multiplied and that my love for John is just a completely different thing. And he's a completely different person and that it's, it's not something that feels confusing mm-hmm. to me be just because they are, you know, it, it's just its own thing. And, um, and it, it, he, it, it's actually, I, I appreciate that he mm-hmm. knew Jim mm-hmm. and he, wow. he was at, uh, Jim's funeral. Wow. Um, so you had met him before. I, I don't ever remember having had a conversation with him, but we sort of ran in the same circles and he and Jim were friendly and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and had hung out. Um, (laughs) but, uh, but I like that he, that he knew him and, uh, you know, when, when I'm having a, a challenging situation with, with one of the kids or something, I will, I will ask Jim, you know, uh, through prayer to, to intercede for, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, for, for our kids. And I recently found out that John does the same thing that John, (laughs) Um, you know, does uh, because he because he knew Jim and because he can see sort of the um, this legacy that he'd left behind. And, and I just I feel like that it really felt like God brought us together, John and I, and that that therefore he must be, you know, the right guy to meet these these challenges. But was there anything specific that you did or John did when you were blending the families to help prepare the kids for it? And I don't know if there even was. It sounds like a lot of it kind of fell into place really beautifully, but any kind of tips you have for families that may be remarrying after loss or the blending family process? Yeah, he did. He um, took the older kids out, mm-hmm. um, you know, individually to sort of, you know, talk talk to them mm-hmm. one-on-one uh, and, like uh, dates. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, like that. Um, and, but yeah, I, th- I think that it went a long way that, that they saw that, um, you know, that, that he wasn't uncomfortable, um, you know, being, being able to, to discuss, um, their, their dad with them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that that was really helpful, but, but mostly just that they could see that, he wanted to be there and he didn't want to just be married to me. He wanted to be part of our family and that his, you know, heart was really open to, um, diving back (laughs) into the deep end of parenting and, um, you know, helping them with their schoolwork and driving them places and being willing to do things for them that I was like, yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. He's (laughs) like, I will drive them. Um, and kids love that. (laughs) Um, So John was married before your marriage to him. He has four kids and he was in a relationship where he was civilly married, but it wasn't marriage in the eyes of the church and ended up being annulled. When you were connecting and dating, did you bond over both of your losses of your previous marriages? And what what did that look like for you guys? Yes, I, I think we definitely did. And that's certainly something that anybody coming into a second marriage is going to have you know, this baggage and baggage is usually considered a, a, a negative thing, but it, mm-hmm. it's just, you're going to come in with, with life experience. Now, you know, mine was, I was widowed. He, uh, 
John is divorced and annulled, which mm. is a different kind of heartbreak. Certainly that was was part of our conversation and, and, and part of our dating and discerning process. Divorce and annulled for people that maybe are listening. And I think there's a conception sometimes of annulment in the Catholic Church as the Catholic divorce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in their view, it's like, well, the T's just divorced then. Can you kind of break down the differences for folks? Because yeah. they are different. Yeah. So marriage and divorce is a civil institution. But as far as annulment, that, that's the Catholic Church being asked to look at, did a marriage happen? Did a valid marriage happen between these two people? Or were there reasons that uh, that mean that even though they thought mm -hmm. that they were married, that uh, that there can be defects in like the in the marriage ceremony, or there can be defects in uh, consent that uh, that mean that that a marriage had not happened between the people. I think that's something that is very controversial and maybe misunderstood by a lot of folks because obviously divorce rates are so high today. And I know you care deeply about the sanctity of marriage and that it's holy God instituted marriage and, you know, what God has brought together, no man shall put asunder. You know, Jesus, our Lord talks about how bad divorce is, but there's that important distinction of was there a marriage to begin with and what are you know according to the our faith and the teaching of our faith there are some prerequisites that make it a marriage for example if you force two people to get married and they're under duress you say you have to get married you have to get married that would not be a valid marriage and so for them to divorce civilly if they civilly got married would not be a divorce in the eyes of god and this is, you know, the teaching of the church, or if they went into marriage and one person was deceiving the other person in some way, there was a, a lack of knowledge to be able to even make full consent. You know, they went in and they were hiding something from the other person that could be grounds for an annulment to say this wasn't a marriage to begin with. And so if you civilly divorce, again, this is not divorce in the eyes of God. But there's also, I will say, even in, in the Catholic tradition and, 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 you know, in the Christian world, some people are saying, well, people are throwing this around too willy nilly. Annulments happen too often. And I mean, this can be the criticism, right? Mm -hmm. That these are happening too often. Did any of that come into your oh, I mean, <laughs> mind or how did you navigate all of that? I, I used to feel all of those things that, that, that you've described. And whenever the subject would come up, my, my standard quip was that I thought that annulments should be granted in the case of kidnapping or non-consummation. And then other than that, probably not. I, I will say that it, it is something that definitely came up really early on in our dating process. I think it was our, our second date. We went uh, hiking and I like we got out of the car, we made it onto the trail. And I was like, so when would be a good time for us to talk about whether you're still actually married? Um, and he's like, now would be the time. And and so mm -hmm. it it was the first time that I had spoken to somebody who presented it to me as a question he was asking the church that what that he knew that his marriage had been hard and that he knew his marriage had broken down and that he was divorced. And then at that point, he wanted to know from the church, was this marriage valid? Was, was the root of the challenges that they faced in the marriage actually the fact that they didn't have the sacramental grace of a marriage um, in, in order to, you know, support them and bolster them. Um, and I, it, it ended up really changing my perspective on sort of the whole idea of annulment and, and on, you know, him specifically as, as, as a person and, and as, um, a potential husband. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, he certainly didn't see it as, as the way that, um, that I think the, you know, the outside stereotype of it is that, well, you just get your divorce from the courthouse and then you get your mm -hmm. marriage, your uh, annulment from the diocese and then you're done. Um, but, but that he really saw it as this, you know, question that he 
that he wanted to have answered and that would explain a lot. <laughs> that was really um, convicting for me uh, that that uh, that it was a different way to look at it than um, you know than I had before. Oh, I guess a, a, another thing that that was really interesting when you know when we were first talking about it is that like, he didn't rejoice when his annulment came through. Like he was he was really devastated um just to think that um you know this thing that he thought was um wasn't and but uh, but then again to to look at it um a little bit farther out um i think that he you know he he sees it differently um and you know to sort of jump back to the to you know to the trustful surrender that even that that even if, uh, you, you know, that God wouldn't will for people to enter into a, uh, a, uh, what seems like a valid marriage, but that it isn't, um, but that, you know, good things can come out of it. Um, uh, you know, purifying suffering can come out of it. And, you know, and of course his children, <laughs> um, came out of it that, that are, um, y you know, that, that have been a source of joy for him and, and are now for me, um, as well. But yeah, I think that, that annulment is, it's such a hard thing. It's such a hard thing to, to wrap your head around. And it is a hard thing for me. And I wouldn't ever want to, down, you know, downplay that because we, we do want to defend and fight for, for marriage. And we want people to stay married. I, I, my, my big question for the Catholic church at, on this subject is uh, I'm sure there is a reason why, but I would love you to be able to uh, find out about annulment before divorce because <laughs> That seems like that would be the right way to go about it for me. But meaning, I, meaning people should pursue annulment before going to a civil divorce, right? Which you, my understanding is, you can't do it like that. You have to be divorced before you oh, can file for I annulment. See. Interesting, but procedurally, you've yes. got to do. You got to complete a civil divorce before right. being able to file for annulment. And certainly, there are lots of reasons where, um, you know, to that you would need to be separated. Mm. But if those uh, mm. considerations weren't in effect and... Uh, well, I'm curious why, why you, what, what's kind of behind that that comment that you're making? Because, you know, what were, what were sort of, I guess, the challenges maybe for John personally or that you've perceived other people experience because they had to go through the process of divorce first oh, before yeah. and annulment? Oh, this isn't, yeah, this is not specific to mm. his situation. I just think like, okay, so he changed the way that I see annulment and mm -hmm. uh, and that in his case, it it makes sense mm -hmm. the the way that the tribunal ruled and said that this was not a valid marriage. Um, but but uh, he they had to be civilly divorced before he could even find that out. Mm, and I, I just I just wonder, like, there are people who don't get granted an annulment, but they've already blown up their life together. I see. I <laughs> um, see. And so tough. Yeah. And, and I, I, I wonder if in the case where annulments are not granted, you know, then are people able to reconcile? Mm. Wouldn't it be easier to reconcile if you hadn't been civilly divorced? Again, this is just all speculation. On, well, I think that the, the really hard teaching, right? That is so, yeah, it is a really hard way. It is the narrow, the narrow, narrow path. And I don't wish it on anyone. And I, you know, I have not had to endure this. Thanks be to God. Like I'm so grateful with my husband and my marriage, but you know, the very hard path for some folks is that they are married. It's a valid marriage. You know, there was full knowledge going into it. There was full consent. Um, you know, they, they, they were freely choosing it. They went into it. They were open to life in the marriage. They knew that that's what they were doing. And then something really goes wrong. Like mm -hmm. there's some haywire stuff that happens or abuse, God forbid, develops, mm -hmm. you know, after the fact. And they do seek a civil divorce because they want to protect themselves, maybe then their children. And the church 
actually has provisions for this. Like, yes, you should not, you know, continue in a place of abuse that's endangering you or your kids. And that's where the church can say, yeah, the right thing may to, may be to get a civil divorce, but then an annulment is not granted. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if it, sometimes it's sought, sometimes it's not, but if it is sought and sometimes it's not granted because yeah, that actually was a valid marriage. You just have a really rough situation with a, a spouse that went super wayward, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe there's, you know, infidelity, not mm -hmm. infidelity at the time of marriage mm -hmm. that was hidden, but infidelity that happened later. And and then you have these real people that are, you know, they, they discover that they, they have this cross of being divorced, not being able to remarry because marriage is for life because yep. their spouse is still alive, but they're not with their spouse. Yeah, no, it's, it is really, really a hard teaching and a hard thing. And, you know, I think that all we can hope for in that situation is that someone facing that would be given the grace that they need to live the the life that they are in. Mm -hmm. um, I have had in my life two really beautiful examples of people who needed to be separated, but did not seek annulments. And one was my, was my, um, late husband, Jim's aunt and uncle, and that they could not live together, but they didn't seek an annulment and they were. And they both, didn't remarry. They didn't. Nope. They, neither one remarried. They would, they would come to the family parties and, um, and they were both, you know, involved in their kids' lives. But, um, but, and, and I think that they still saw each other as, um, as they, they did, they saw each other as their spouses, but they just, um, there were good wow. reason that they couldn't live together. And mm. that wasn't something that I had any concept could even be possible as I was growing up. But then there, um, there she was in, uh, this by mutual agreement, you're saying. Mm -hmm. So they were like, they couldn't, they, they freely fully chose the marriage. It was a valid marriage. And they just, for whatever reason, personality wise, just developed. They couldn't stand each other, and they chose to live apart for harmony's sake. Was that was that what? I was, think yes. I, know I'm, I mean, and, and there were uh, there were serious issues mm -hmm. that were uh, that, that were making um, a uh, you know it, it wasn't um, it wasn't a cavalier choice, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. but yeah, there were reasons why you wouldn't want to live with this person, but but they, they did believe that their marriage was valid. And, wow. and so they, um, you know, they, they lived their marriage much differently than, you know, different than, than the ideal. But I think it's a beautiful example. And I, I appreciated at least even knowing that that was possible. Um, heroic. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I that's so. like, you know, the love of a saint to the point of obedience to our Lord and obedience, not to put themselves in, you know, necessarily abusive or destructive patterns. Cause for whatever reason, I know we're not in the details of their story, mm -hmm. but it was serious reasons that they were not living under the same roof. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that, that they're not remarrying because that would go against the, the teaching of mm -hmm. our Lord. You know, we, you can't just throw away a spouse, a true spouse. This is a real marriage, a true spouse and remarry. I mean, that's a really, that's a really tough teaching for a lot of people, but I do. I also have seen people live that even mm -hmm. when, you know, in good times and in bad. And I am thinking particular of a case when I was living in Washington, DC, I was on a silent retreat and I met this very joyful, very beautiful woman. And, you know, her story is pretty public. She has children. She's practicing her faith. She's full of love for Jesus. Her husband's in prison. Mm because he was a spy. <laughs> he was literally a foreign agent that, you know, turned his back on American people and, you know, was treasonous and was doing work for another foreign government, you know, while he was supposed to be working for our government. Long story short, he's in prison for life. Wow. Living a double life, mm -hmm. but it was a valid marriage. You know, mm -hmm. this developed later on and she did not remarry. You know, she's not, she, mm -hmm. she's living a single as a single woman, even though she's still married to this man in prison. She prays for him. I think she might visit him once a year. And I, I remember learning her story and just being floored yeah. by her witness. I'm sure it's hard, extremely hard on multiple levels for her, but she's faithful to her vows. And that, yeah, that <laughs> sort of, it feels like it's incredible. It feels, you know, they, what it's St. Maximilian Colby, they say is a martyr of charity, right? Like that, that's what that feels like. <laughs> Um, uh, 
Yeah. And I, I, so in the in the case of Jim's um, aunt and uncle, it, it was his aunt was the one who had married into the family. But um, she, you know, wasn't ostracized. She was still welcomed and 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 considered as as a part of the family. We and named one of our daughters after her because, um, you know, she was she was that big of an influence on his life. Um so, and, and I know, I, I know another family locally that, um, you know, that, that was in a similar situation where couldn't live together, but didn't, um, but didn't seek an annulment. And so I, I think that it, it doesn't feel right in some ways to say like, oh, and aren't you so good for doing that? You know, <laughs> uh, suffering, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, it's like, oh, but, it's, it's a lot. but you know, all yeah. I can hope is mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that we aren't given the graces mm. to handle or necessarily even to understand mm. the the crosses that, that are given to other people. And I think that even when people come up to me and say, like, or more often in a comment on something, say to me, like, how could you get married again? I could never get married again. And I say, like, it's great that you think that right now. That is the right thing for you to think because you're married to the person that you're married to now. But you might feel completely different mm-hmm. if you were in a different situation, um, if you were in different circumstances, and and if God worked to give you the graces mm-hmm. to to manage the plan that He has for you. It's such a good point, Kendra. The God gives us the unique graces we need for our for our lot in life, and we can marvel at other people's sufferings or blessings, but we are not in their shoes. We are not in their shoes. So we, you know, we, we, God is not giving us the grace for their shoes. Right. It's yeah, a really good, exactly. it's a, it's a good reminder. Cause I, I think it is easy to even be scandalized sometimes by other people's suffering mm-hmm. or, you know, unfortunately envy other people's blessings or whatever, the whole gamut of comparison that we can enter into when we look at, you know, other human beings and just to remember like God, God gave us our life to live and with the graces he gives us and we're supposed to, you know, maximally love and grow in virtue and all of these things, but it is, it's our life to live and their life to live and we can love and serve, but the comparison can become a a stumbling block if we spend too much time on it, basically. Yeah, Yeah, it's true. And, Mm. and I think that that's something that is, I would say Mm. a peril of, Mm. of Catholic influencing, right? That, that, or any influence, Christian (laughs) influence, any influencing, any any influencing that, Mm. That the Mm -hmm. Catholic Church has a method by which we identify people who have lived lives of virtue that we should emulate, and those people are already dead. And and it's not how many Instagram likes you got or video views you got. (laughs) It's a great point. And so any of us who are living, like we are still stumbling through trying Mm -hmm. to find our way, Um, and and that you know, the, the end of our sufferings, the end Mm -hmm. of our, you know, the challenges that we face, you know, we can't see that we can't and other people can't. So, um, such a good point. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And the markers of holiness. I mean, look at what, you know, to be tended to value in this world, which is, you know, comfort, success, you know, worldly things, or, you know, health or beauty or whatever the things that we may be tempted to value, and even the, or even the good things like the spiritual things that we may want to value, you know, this uh, uh, graces that we may value. But at the end of the day, what what we when you look at back at someone's life and whether or not they lived a holy life. Right. And I like the, to it looks different. <laughs> yeah. But especially mm-hmm. if I if I'm worrying like, oh, you know, I need to I need to be sharing this with more people. I need to you know, I need to reach more people be, with, you know, with my apostolate or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I think about St. Therese of Lisieux mm. and how she lived a completely anonymous mm. life in this tiny convent in this small town in France. Mm. And but she wrote a really good book. At, but what yes, <laughs> but, yeah. but at but at yeah. the behest at the yes, direction of her sister, she wrote it down. It's a great no point. one saw it during her life. Mm. And then after her death. It, it it was published and became one of the best selling books in the world ever Mm -hmm. and such an influence on so many people. And she never saw any of that. All she did was, was be obedient to a direction given Mm -hmm. to her 
by her mother superior, who was also her big sister, and that must have been bothersome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a good one to think about. <laughs> that's a good one to think about. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you for being so open and sharing about it because I know obviously it's all very private stuff, your family, your location, making these decisions. But I know that when people hear stories like yours, it brings a lot of hope. <laughs> and then there's also, it's instructive. It's like how to do these complicated things when life is messy and life gets messy and, and can include things like loss. So thank you. It's it's all very beautiful and, and very good. How has your work changed or has it changed since remarrying? Yeah, I uh, have been taking things a little bit slower on, on the on the work front. I've always tried to view it. Um, and I, I imagine you can can understand this. But you know, when you're working uh, as a Catholic professionally, that that you you do have to allow yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that there uh, that that there mm -hmm. will be an sort of ebb and flow on things. Um, so I've tried to let myself be led on, you know, where I'm supposed to spend most of my energy. But yes, Catholic All Year is alive <laughs> and well, and, uh, and I've got a great team, and we are, yeah, continuing mm -hmm. to create, I hope, great content <laughs> for families who want to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who want to practice liturgical living in the home and want to use that uh, that framework of the liturgical calendar to, um, you know, to introduce Catholic doctrine and saints' lives and, and things to their families. Jim was always a big supporter of, of Catholic All Year and thought that what I was doing was important, which John feels the same way, which is, which is great. Um, so, uh, and he actually used to be uh, the editor of the OSV newspaper, so uh, very cool. So I have now in-house editing, which is great. <laughs> um, and yeah, it kind of feels like like there might mm -hmm. be things we could collaborate on in the future, which would be really fun. I, I like working with him. So, all right, tell us more about the calendar. Okay, and your latest right. projects. Yes. With all right. So I I brought I brought you our calendar. Thank you. And <laughs> it's super cute. That the, is super cute. The illustrations in it. This. Uh, for 2025 are all little liturgical living in the home Aww. traditions that are our favorites. My kids were so excited looking at it. The calendar has obviously feast days and seasons and fasting days. And uh, and it also has little reminders of prayers that are associated with particular feast days or little activities that you might want to do with your families. And I think especially moms of all young children you know, that it can feel really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's just, you know, like little things mm -hmm. that you can do. And if, you know, the one thing you do in November is pray for this. the dead this in a is, cemetery. I love this. I mean, this is so great. And I, I, to be honest, I don't use a real calendar, but I'm going to take this, okay. put it in my kitchen because <laughs> even what you've so thoughtfully chosen for each month. And I just went to November cause we're, this yep. is coming out in November, this episode. And it says pray for the dead in, in a cemetery. And this is the Christian tradition of prayer for the dead, um, rest in peace, prayer for those that have passed before us. And it is a very um, special thing to go to a cemetery and thank God for the gift of our life and the gift of salvation and also to pray for those that have passed before us. And so yes. you have this pray for the dead in a cemetery. Can you just share briefly, because we're going to get asked this in the comment section, and I think it's a great question and debate, and we're not going to get into the whole debate theologically here, but what is the scriptural background and Christian tradition around praying for the dead? Because there is some controversy here among uh, folks on different parts of Christendom, those that are maybe evangelical or Protestant who are hesitant about this because there is a prohibition about um, inviting the dead, you know, trying to communicate with the dead in mm -hmm. the Old Testament. How is this different? If you can just share. Yeah. So the, the, Catholic tradition of praying for the dead in a cemetery, especially in the month of November, comes from the the Catholic Church's teaching on purgatory. The Catholic teaching is that that what we read in the Bible, the you know teachings of the the early church fathers, has this purgatory shaped hole, and so we there there must be some place of purification, and there are scripture verses that, that allude to mm -hmm. this, but there must be some place of purification where the dead can't 
um, can't pray for themselves. They can't do mm-hmm. good works anymore. Um, but uh, but they are there waiting and and undergoing this time of purification. Mm-hmm. And that we, the living, can still pray for them. And these are people who, you know, in the, in the, like, you know, sheep versus goats, they're sheep. They've been, they've been sorted into, Mm -hmm. you know, that they will go to heaven, but they're not ready to present themselves before God. Therefore, (laughs) uh, therefore they, they need our prayers. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's really meaningful for children that, that, I think that there's a tendency in our country and in our culture to try to sort of hide from death to, and especially to hide death from children. But, but it is this natural part of, of life and that it's not something that, that if we believe what we say, we believe it's not something that we have to have this horror of that we can see it as part of our journey. And, and that, uh, I, you know, my kids get so excited when I tell them, all right, we're going to go to the cemetery. We're going to pray mm-hmm. for the people who are buried there and that our prayers might mean that, uh, you know, that might coincide with them, you know, reaching the end of their period of purification and that they might mm-hmm. be able to, you know, shoot right up to heaven mm-hmm. and imagine what a great, um, Welcome. That will be when we're, when, you know, when we get to be reunited with people that we had prayed for and even strangers, it's such a meaningful prayer to say, you know, to pray for the people that we love who have died. Mm. And then also for people who don't have people to pray for them. Mm. And we pray for the repose of their soul as a phrase often used. And to go all the way back to what you were saying at the beginning, which was so beautiful about taking everything in life as a gift from God and really meant for us specifically by God whether in his allowance in his will or specifically willed this was for our good and he uses it specifically for our good. Anyways, uh, I think it's really a beautiful thing to remember that when we (laughs) accept everything we get in this life with full trust in Jesus and, you know, asking God to use it for his glory and, you know, having it with that sporting, heroic, loving spirit, you know, that means that after we pass, that's less purification and purgatory. That's why they make the joke like, you know, if you annoy me in this life, or if I have this, I get, I'm in, impatient with you, but I'm still, I feel impatient, but I still act patient with you. I'm staving off time in purgatory. I That's right. You've heard that. I mean, no, I have heard they, they... you are my purgatory. Well, but the joke we're is... all need purgation. We all need purgation. <laughs> yes. In this and the life joke the is next. that you can, yeah. you know, that, that it, it's going to take a lot more time to work it off in purgatory than it would now. So yes. just, you know, make don't, the most of it. Yeah. Don't get the blemish now, but yeah. Kendra, you are awesome. Thank you so much for coming on again. Where can yeah. people find your work? Uh, they can find me at catholicallyear.com. And I am uh, Kendra Tierney Norton or Catholic All Year on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Formed, on uh, Facebook, YouTube. We're just all over the place. Congra- <laughs> Congratulations again. So happy you. for you. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.